I just wanted to welcome you all here again. Look at you guys just hugging on each other and stuff out there. That's so fun. I love it. Welcome. Welcome. How many are here for the first time? Good to have you. Thank you for coming. I wanted to, um, I love this. It makes me cry, this song. I think that that should be our prayer this year. Chains fall, fear bow. I love that part. Here, now. Jesus, you change everything. Lives healed, hope found. Here, now. Jesus, you change everything. I want to be changed this year. I really want to be changed through this. And so um, that is my prayer. And um, I wanted to very quickly say something to and encourage you guys. You know, you probably looked at your... Do you love these booklets that Alexandra put together? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Wow. You know, she's, she's a lawyer. She thinks this way. You know, I'm a scatterbrain. I don't do that. <laughs> you know, but I'm so thankful for her. And I'm so thankful that she's going to be teaching this morning. I wanted to encourage you, as you've looked through... Those of you that have looked through the, the, the books this year... Um, there is, um, it, it says in the introduction, you know, read these 16 chapters, and I'm sure some of you went, ah, 16 chapters. Um, we probably won't do a, a, a verse by verse this year. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, anyway, so, but if you, if you get a chance, this is a story, and it's one of the coolest stories in the Bible, so it's not like reading through Leviticus and who begat who or, you know, any of that. This is really interesting reading, so if you get the chance and you can read through everything, please do. If not, when we go through it, there is, it, it'll say, like, it'll highlight, you know, read this chapter, read this chapter. So if you can't do the whole thing, don't say, well, I haven't read it, so I can't come. Just come, because we will highlight it, and we will work our way through it together. So I just didn't want, excuse me, want that to overwhelm you and go, hey, no, I can't do that much reading, because all of us have a limited amount of time that we are able to put in, some more, some less. So don't let any of that overwhelm you. This is going to be a fun year and, and a different one than what we normally do. So I'm excited about it. And that being said, I'm going to let Alexander come up this year, this week. Good morning, ladies. So today we get an introduction to the overall um, study, and we're going to cover three of David's psalms, plus a little excerpt from Acts. Um, I have to start by saying that I was actually a little puzzled by this introductory lesson because our workbook author, at least as far as I could see, didn't tell us why these three psalms out of the 70-some he wrote, she chose for this lesson. As I pondered how to approach it, because as Raylan said, I am a lawyer and I work with framework. You know, I need an outline. I have to have things organized, which is why I have notes. Because without notes, I'm naked and I can't cope. <laughs> so um, as I... As I prayed about this and pondered it, a thought came into my mind, and I looked into what order, maybe, did David write these psalms? And as a result of that, I included in the books a chronology of one person's idea, or maybe several persons' idea, of how the psalms should be ordered. But, of course, none of us really know because he didn't mark them like I would write a brief and put the date that I executed it on. We can tell with some because of the events that he talks about in his psalm, so we can kind of date them, but we don't know for sure. Nonetheless, um, I just wanted to mention that some believe that Psalm 39 is actually the very first psalm that David wrote, and that he pinned it right after he was anointed as king by Samuel, which we'll read about in 1 Samuel 16, and that he was only 10 to 15 years old when he wrote this psalm. Some believe that Psalm 40 was written just before, during, or just after Absalom's rebellion, either when he was receiving provi provisions at Mahanaim, I think is how you say it, or when he pardoned Shimei, who was 
you'll find the man who cursed him as he was coming back to Jerusalem. And that David was about 60 or 61 years old when he wrote that. And some believe that Psalm 37 was actually the very last psalm that David wrote, and that he was about 70 when he wrote that one. So given those suggested dates, it occurred to me that maybe our author chose these psalms because she thinks that they show the progression of David's faith journey and relationship with God. On the other hand, she could have chose them because she thinks they best exemplify or reveal the things about David that made God testify that he was a man after his own heart who would do all his will. And of course, it's possible she chose him for some other reason that never occurred to me. Takeaways, you know, I, I have always been one to have takeaways at the end of a lesson so that we have something to take out with us to ponder as we go through our week. But because of the um, volume of the material, we have almost 80 verses this week. Don't even think about how many verses with 15 chapters for next week. Um, I couldn't really do that. So I've kind of sprinkled takeaways throughout the study. Um, and as an approach, I just want you to know that we're going to be studying these three psalms again in Lesson 15. So as I prayed and pondered um, how to present the lesson today, I thought a lot about the chronology, but I also thought a lot and prayed a lot about what Raylan had said at church Sunday a couple weeks ago, that our goal this year is to try to discern why God said, David, this incredibly sinful man, as sinful as I am, as sinful as we all are, was a man after his own heart, someone who would do all his will, and how we maybe can become women of the same type, of the same fiber. And so that's kind of how I approached the lesson today, and I hope that God speaks so that you get something out of it as we go through. So let's just take a moment to pray, um, to get our minds focused so that we can begin. Father God, I just thank you that you woke us all up with the breath of life this morning, Lord, so that our eyes would open to see this beautiful day. Thank you for stirring up our hearts and our energy so that we could bring ourselves here, even though for some of us, like me, we're not morning people and it can be hard to get going. Thank you for this lovely worship. Every week we are so blessed with Roxy's worship and how she leads us into your, your throne room with, that we can honor and praise and glorify you with our voices. I ask now that you just help each of us focus. Focus our hearts, focus our minds, focus every fiber of our being into what we're about to see, what we're about to learn, what you're about to tell us. Let us sit at your feet, Lord, and learn something new today. And I just lift this up in your son's most precious name. Amen. 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 So, with that said, I'm going to start by reading some of the verses because I can't wean myself off that addiction. <laughs> so, let's um, read the Acts passage because it's very short. And I did add two verses to it because I wanted you to have some context for Paul's words here. <clears throat> so we'll begin. But going on from Perga, they, Paul, Barnabas, and others, arrived at the city in Antioch, and on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the Law and the Prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out from it. For a period of about 40 years, he put up with them, and I love the way he said he put up with them, in um, the land of Egypt. In the wilderness, when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an, an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. 
After these things, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And after he, God, had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. From the descendants of this man, according to the promise, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus. As is apparent from this passage, Paul does indeed have a word or a statement of exhortation and encouragement for the Jews in Pisidian Antioch. And that word is that Jesus Christ is the descendant of David and the Messiah, the Savior that God promised to bring to Israel. And of course, this is the good news. And that's why I wanted to read this, because the gospel is the good news, and it's it's the, our primary focus. I mean, it's our best promise that Jesus saved us. But for purposes of today's lesson, I want to focus on verse 22, where Paul tells those listening, us, his readers as well, that after the Israelites asked for a king, and after God removed Saul as that king, God raised up David to be their king, someone God found for himself. And we'll see in 1 Samuel 13, 14, and 15, 11, that it is God who chose David. And the person whom God testified was a man after my own heart who will do all my will. After all, it is this testimony by God that's going to be our main focus of the study this year as we will be on a quest to discover what it means to be a woman after God's heart who will do all his will. So what do we learn from verse 22 in terms of what it might be to be a person after or according to God's heart? And the word cardia here um, is used to mean in whom God delights, a person in whom God delights. Vine's expository dictionary of the Old and New Testament words, I have all these materials I look at, says that the word for heart is used figuratively for the hidden springs of the personal life. That is, it refers to the inward life of a person or to who a person is on the inside. You know that part we keep concealed? Using these definitions, perhaps David was a person after God's heart because he, in his inward and personal life, sought after and delighted in God, and as a result, God delighted in him. Similarly, what do we learn from verse 22 about what it might mean to be a person who will do all God's will? From Paul's word, words here, it appears that the phrase, who will do all my will, refers to someone who just doesn't give it a slap and a dash, but someone who will well and rightly carry out or execute God's will in every possible way. He'll do the whole of God's will or every aspect of God's will. Vines um, states, and I thought this was really interesting, that a person's fulfillment of God's will, when we fulfill God's will, that's a sign that we're in a spiritual relationship with the Lord. So that's a really good thing. It also says that poiai, the Greek word translated here, will do, includes the idea of adopting a way of expressing thoughts and feelings through acts. So we act out what God wants us to do because we want to do his will on the inside. Pause, which is the word for all, can mean to the highest degree or to the maximum of what is referred to. So from these definitions, we see that God knew, even though David may not have known, that David was a person who, unlike Saul, would well and rightly execute and carry out all of God's will, fully and completely, down to the very last detail, to the absolute and very best of his ability. So with these thoughts in our mind, let's look at the three Psalms chosen by our author to see what they reveal about David that might provide 
further information for us as to why God testified that David was a man after his own heart who would do all his will. And because I'm not going to be able to go over each verse, I ask that if you have your Bibles, please do open them so that you can follow along. Because, you know, I'm going to be moving kind of quickly. Is um, that starting with 37? No, I'm going to start actually at 39 and then go to 40 and then come back to 37 because I'm using that chronology <laughs> as a framework. Thank you. So... In looking at Psalm 39, you'll see that after some introductory descriptive language, Paul, David begins with the words, I said, I said. The word that David uh, uses here is a mar, which can be translated as to say in one's heart, to say in one's heart. So from this, we see that David was a contemplative person meaning he thought deeply, he ruminated and meditated on and about things in his own heart and mind. He's thinking about God. He's thinking about God all the time. It's in him. As we read in the remainder of the first three verses of this psalm, we see that on this particular occasion, David was, among other things, contemplating the issue of sin and how to avoid it. He speaks of guarding his ways so that he wouldn't sin with his tongue. And when he says that, what he's meaning here is that he wants to restrain or keep within bounds his actions, his character, and in particular, avoiding any kind of lying or falsehoods. He also says that he wants to guard his mouth as with a muscle, especially when he's in the presence of the wicked. And this phrase, as with a muscle, means to avoid hasty speech or, um, I can't think of the word, but you know, irresponsible might be one, speech, when he's around wicked people. And I think this is really important because I don't know about you, but in my situations, if I get off on something, you know, when you get on a negative spiral and you're spouting words, in front of believers, they're always telling you, take it to God and you need to pray and, and positive things. But if you get in that kind of frame of mind with non-believers, they urge you on. Do that sin. Do that sin. Jump in. It'll be great. And so we see from this that David understands and believes that God exists. There's no doubt in his mind, but that sin exists too that sin is wrong in God's eyes, and that sin is something that could be and should be avoided completely, if possible. But for us humans, that's not possible, really, while we're in our bodies. But that we need to take steps to place boundaries so that we don't voluntarily sin. At the end of verse 3 and then continuing through verse 6, we see that David is now speaking with his tongue, meaning he's speaking out loud, probably a prayer, asking God to make him know or allow him to understand how fleeting, how transitory life is, and that the value of his life is not measured by the things he amasses, because once he dies, those things are going to be possessed by someone else anyway, and he may not even know who they are. <coughs> From these verses, it seems that David, again, he expresses his understanding that God exists, but he also, through his prayers, reveals that he understands and believes that he can interact with God. He can have a meaningful and an actual relationship with God through prayer, through approaching God, through seeking God, and that he knows that God is control, in control of life on earth, and that the real meaning in life is not found in those material things that the TV tells us we must have to have, or we will simply die, waste away, or otherwise be unpopular. You know, we can have the same understanding by cultivating a prayer life. We can develop an active and actual and deep relationship with God following this kind of an example, seeking him out. David then speaks in verses 7 through 13 of the fact that he's placed his hope and expectations in God. 
who is able to deliver David from all his transgressions, who is able to keep David from bringing the reproach of the foolish. And this word reproach here means an object of shame or scorn. You know, he doesn't want to be ridiculed by foolish people. And I would think here maybe he's talking about people who don't understand God and the relationship. Um, and who will do this, speaking of God again, and does do this by reproof or correction, chastening, disciplining, up to and including the point of, as David says, consuming as a moth what is precious to him, which is a way of saying, causing to vanish or dissolve those things that are dear to David's heart, things that he takes pleasure in, even up to the point of taking his very life and breath. And I just want to take a moment here because death is such a difficult topic for, I think, most of us, other than we all say, you know, we want to be in heaven with the Lord, but the getting there is the hard part, you know, that we don't like to talk about. But I want to emphasize um, that we need to remember that even in our death, God uses that as part of his plan. You may not know, although I think you will because you'll be seeing it from eternity, you may not know how God uses your life or your death. But I know from when my mom and my sister died that God used their deaths, even though I didn't like it, to bring many to the Lord because of their example and how they had lived their lives. And that clearly was his plan because perhaps without their deaths, those people never would have been saved. David also asked God for mercy and grace in reproving and chastening him so that he can live and not be destroyed by the mere punishment. And then ends this psalm by pleading with God to hear or to listen to his prayer and cry for help and to speak to him so that he wisely uses that small span of life he has been given while he's here on earth. To me, these verses reveal that David wants his desire, the desire of his heart, is to live and behave as God wants him to, that he wants to do what's right in God's eyes, that he understands and accepts that when he fails to do so, that is, when he sins, which we all do, God will and should reprove and chasten him so he can get back on track spiritually and not be deceived or misled by the material things of life or anything else that causes us to move away from God. And that he understands, and I think this is critical, that he can only live a life that is pleasing to God with God's help yeah. and in God's power and not in his own power. And we, just like David, we need God's power to live a life that's pleasing to him as well. And we get that power by seeking him out. Assuming, as I mentioned um, earlier, that David was only 10 to 15 years old when he wrote this psalm, he understood at quite a young age, in my opinion, looking back at it from this much more old age, he already understood as a young person that he had a propensity to sin, that he had a sinful nature, and that he needed God and God's power in his life to overcome that nature to live as God wanted him to live in accordance with God's commands, precepts, laws, and directives, and to live a meaningful life, not a life consumed with material things that do not last. To me, these are super deep thoughts for someone only 10 to 15 years old. I mean, I think back when I was that age, this is not the kind of thought I was thinking. I was focused, sadly, on many other things, many other things. And I think that, you know, as we look at David's um, dedication, even at that young age, to God and seeking after him and seeking after his will, these are goals and desires that I want for myself, and I'm sure you all want for yourselves too. How can we get deeper with God? So now let's look at Psalm 40, which was written perhaps 45, even 50 years after Psalm 39. We'll start with the first three verses again. Um, three is a good number, you know, Father, Son, and Spirit. Three is good to start with. Which tell us that David waited patiently for the Lord. That word patiently can also be translated looked eagerly for, but was patient to see. 
That is, David, um, he actively sought out God by crying out to God in a time of great distress to him, um, if it's accurate, the time of Absalom's rebellion. From his words, I infer that by this time, if not sooner, David's relationship with God had developed to the point that he was completely confident and had no um, doubt that God would hear and listen to his prayers and petitions. And we can share the same confidence. God does listen. He does hear. These words also indicate that David's expectation and hope that God was able to and would deliver him from sin and reproach, something you recall he spoke of in Psalm 39, 7 to 11, has not only persisted, but has become stronger and more firmly established over the course of his life. In fact, by this point in his life, it appears that David turned to and relied upon God to deliver him in times of crisis, even though he also took action on his own behalf. After all, as we all know, the Lord helps those who help themselves. <laughs> That, of course, isn't in the Bible, but I got taught that. I'm sure all of you did, too. Additionally, while we see that um, from these verses that God actually did respond to David's cry for help by delivering him from the crisis he was in, I mean, look at verse 2, where David speaks of God having brought him up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and set his feet upon a rock, making his footsteps firm, we also see that David understood that it was God who would decide if he would act on David's behalf, and that if he did, it was God who would decide how he was going to act on David's behalf, and that God would act, because doing so would bring glory to God by causing, um, as said in verse 3, many to see and fear and trust in the Lord and in God's willingness and to act on behalf of those who place their trust in him. Like David, we need to be bold to seek God and then wait patiently but eagerly for him to act, while at the same time we need to understand and accept that God, and not you or me, will decide how and when he will act in any given circumstance. We don't get to dictate the outcome, but we can certainly petition for an outcome that we would like. In verses 4 and 5, and especially verse 5, where David writes, Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders which you have done in your thoughts toward us. There is none to compare with you. We see that David recognized and understood that God is higher and greater than he is in every measurable respect, but is still so thoughtful of mankind as a whole, and of David in particular. God cares about each of us individually, too. It's not just all his chosen people in um, a broad sense, but each of us individually, he loves, he cares for, he listens to, he leads and guides. David also appears to recognize and understand that by humbling himself before God through placing his trust, faith, and confidence in God, rather than relying on himself, on sinful conduct, or on other people, that he, like all, as he says, who have made the Lord his trust, the object of his confidence and his place of refuge and security will be blessed, happy, content. We need to remember to approach God with that same humility, recognizing who we are versus who he is and the relationship between that. But we aren't to be scared to approach God because he's so above us. We're to be happy eager and willing to approach God in all our nakedness because he loves us and he cares about us as individuals. He will listen. He will act. He will bring us through. Verse 6 through 8 tells us uh, that God, or that David delighted to do God's will and that David made sure that God's law, as contained in the Holy Scriptures, was within his heart, meaning that it was 
part of the very fiber of his being, that it was actually part of him, just like his arms and his legs and his head and his brain. He also seems to understand that it was his willingness to do and his obedience in doing God's will that pleased God and not his or our making sacrifices or offerings while we continue to be disobedient in large or small ways. Obedience, it's the important thing. In verses 9 to 10, we learn that David was not shy about his faith. To the contrary, he willingly and enthusiastically proclaimed glad tidings of God's righteousness, spoke of God's faithfulness and God's salvation, and did not conceal God's loving kindness and God's truth to or from those around him. I infer from this, and this is just my inference, that David tried to make sure that those around him understood and knew that it was God, not David, who was responsible for and provided every good thing in David's life. We need to recognize this in our own lives as well and make sure that we give God the honor, the glory, the praise, which he deserves because he cares for us so well even in the hard times, because we're not immune from hard times. We're just promised that he'll bring us through them. Finally, verses 11 to 17 tell us that David understood it was God who would decide whether or not to preserve him, that it was God who would determine when and how any such deliverance would come, and that it was God who would decide whether or not to punish those who were afflicting David. Nonetheless, Confident that God would listen to him and would not withhold his compassion from him, despite his having been surrounded by evils beyond number, despite having been overtaken by his iniquities, and despite having his heart uh, fail him, meaning he lacked courage and strength, David, nonetheless, he voiced his views about what he hoped God would do for him and when he would do it and what he hoped God would do to his enemies. But after seeking these things and presenting his petitions to the Lord, he left those matters in God's hands. And David made it clear that like all seekers of God should, he would rejoice and be glad in God and would continually praise and glorify God regardless, regardless of what God chose to do or not to do on his behalf. And we need to be that way too. You know, we have to accept God's will in our lives, even if it's not what we would choose. Because God, we all know this, he works everything together for good for those who love him, for those who are called according to his purpose. But we should also remember that he is the expert at bringing beauty out of ashes. So we can just rely on him and have faith that in the end it will all come out well. By the time he pinned Psalm 40 at age 60 or so, we see that David appears to have matured spiritually as reflected by his turning to God in time of crisis, by his waiting patiently for God to respond to his cries for help, and that once God did respond, to remember to praise and thank God for acting on his behalf. This spiritual maturity is also demonstrated by his understanding that God created and is in control of everything here on earth that God desires his people to willingly and delightfully, delightfully obey him, that God desires his people to tell others of him, of his divine attributes, such as loving kindness and truth, and of all he had and would do on behalf of his people and on behalf of us individually, and that it was God, not David, who would determine the outcome of the crises David faced, whether by ensuring the success of the efforts that he was making on his own behalf, whether by saving him through some other means that David could not imagine or anticipate, and how many times has that happened for us? You know, it's like the check that comes out of nowhere, or the answer to a prayer that from a di direction you could never anticipate, or whether by doing nothing to rescue David, it all depended on what pleased God and furthered God's purposes, because that's God's framework for acting. <laughs>
His spiritual maturity continued to grow up to the very end of his life when he's believed to have written Psalm 37. So let's go to that one now. As we see from verses 1 to 6, David has learned or understood that it is unproductive to fret, to become angry, furious, and vexed about, or to envy evildoers or wrongdoers. Instead, David encourages his readers to place their trust in and rely upon God, to do good, or to put it a bit differently, to be moral by committing your way, your course of life, your actions to him to dwell, to abide and settle down in the land, to cultivate, which here is used as the word cherish, the faithfulness of human conduct, and to take exquisite delight in the Lord. When you do this, David tells us in verses 5 and 6, God will give or grant you all the desires and requests of your heart and will exalt you by bringing forth or exhibiting your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. This phrase is another way of saying that God will bless you with happiness and contentment. So again, let's follow David's example in that. David has also learned and understood, as he tells us in verses 7 to 15, that it is better to rest in and wait patiently for the Lord to deal with evilness and evildoers in life rather than to get angry, take your own steps to balance the scales, or fret about the apparent success or profitability of evilness and evildoers. As he explains, and isn't that our first response normally, you know, I'm going to make this right, I'm going to do this, I will make it work, I will bring things to fruition in the right way. But as David points out here, when we take things into our own hands, it can lead us into doing evil ourselves. Because evil, so we should just wait on God. God doesn't slip into evil. People slip into evil. We also need to remember that, as David tells us here, God will cut off, eliminate, destroy quickly um, the evil, the evildoers himself. So we don't need to do anything in terms of dealing with evil or evildoers or their plots, their schemes, other than rely in God, trust in God and pray, put our petitions before his throne. We need to allow God to deal with evil and evildoers. We need to remember that um, the righteous, the blameless, will inherit or take possession of the land and will take delight or be exquisitely blessed with abundant prosperity, health, welfare, whatever we need. Indeed, as David uh, states here, God actually laughs with contempt and derision. I just love that picture of God laughing at those who plot evil against the righteous, the afflicted, and the needy, because he knows that their day of disaster and death is coming. He knows that their evil plots will be turned back upon themselves, and he knows that in the end, they will take the sword that they meant for someone else. Finally, as we see in the last 24 verses of the Psalms, and that's a big chunk to take all at once, I apologize, but we have time limits. <laughs> David understands, David's learned, that it is far better to be righteous, that it is far better to live a life in obedience to God's laws, rather than to seek material prosperity through wickedness and evil doing. As he writes in verses 17 to 19, God sustains, he supports and upholds those with integrity and those who are sound and wholesome in nature. He knows, he takes notice of the death of the blameless, he makes sure that the righteous and the blameless are not put to shame or disappointed, but assures that they have abundance even in times of famine. And he gives the righteous and the blameless an everlasting inheritance, the thing that we refer to now as eternal life. At the same time, as David writes in verses 20, 28, and 38, God also makes sure that the wicked will perish, vanish away, and be cut off forever which is sad, which is sad. And that's why we want to draw all to God that we can. In fact, as David writes in verses 23, 24, 33, 34, and 37, God takes pleasure in, 
he establishes the steps or the course of life of and exalts the righteous and the blameless, making sure that even when they experience calamities, they will not be destroyed unless that's his will, but will have their needs met even to the point of making sure they have food to eat so they do not starve, that they will not be condemned as guilty, at least in God's eyes, maybe in the eyes of the world, but not in the eyes of God, that they will see the wicked being cut off and perishing, and that they will see the righteous and blameless prosper and have a future. Because of this, David tells us in verses 27 to 29, in fact, he urges us to turn from evil and do good, because if we do, we will abide forever. We will not be forsaken by God, but will be preserved, and we will inherit the land, and I like to think of the land as heaven, and live in it forever. David also tells us in verses 30 and 31, along with 39, how to discern who is among the righteous and the blameless. These people speak wisdom, God's wisdom, not our own. They have the teachings or word of God in their heart. They make every effort not to slip into evil or wickedness, and they take refuge in, they flee to him for protection. And as David concludes in verse 40, because the righteous and blameless acknowledge that God is God and they are not, and because they are obedient to God, and because they trust in and rely on God, the Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them. So what do we learn from these psalms that may help us understand why God testified that David was a man after his heart who would do all his will? Normally, as I said earlier, at this point, I would provide some takeaways or some closing thoughts for you know, meditation over the course of the week. And initially, I thought I would do that here. Um, but the more I meditated on Psalm 37, especially verses 30 through 40, the more I became convinced that maybe David, in his own words, has given us an answer, at least a partial answer, to this question by providing us with insight into how to identify the righteous and the blameless. Perhaps a person after God's heart who will do all his will is someone who acknowledges who God is and who they are in relationship to God. Someone who humbles themselves before God, who obeys God and his words willingly and with delight, who trusts in and relies upon God and shares their faith to the extent they can with others, and certainly lives out their faith so people can read that testimony, who does not or attempts not to slip into evil or wickedness, and in the event that they do, makes no excuses for their behavior, but acknowledge it for what it is, sin against God, and who flees to God for protection, security, and refuge. I'm sure as we go deeper in this study, we will learn that the answers to these questions are a bit more complicated than what I just said. Nonetheless, I think this is a good initial conclusion about what it is to be a person after God's heart who will do his will, and that it's a good point for embarking upon this year's study. I want to add now, because last night um, at the Tuesday study, I was a little distracted. Roxy's worship is so beautiful. Um, but we have a lot of people coming in, you know, and it's easy to get distracted. If we take away anything from these three psalms, I think the really important thing that we need to take away is look how naked David made his heart before God as he's pinning these psalms and all the psalms that we are going to study. David was willing to drop all his defenses in the presence of the Lord. And I know God inspired Roxy's choice of songs because look at this one called me higher. 
and I could hold on. I could hold on to who I am, never let you change me from the inside. I could be safe. I could be safe here in your arms, never leave home, never let the walls down. But if we don't, if we don't let go, if we don't let him in, if we don't let our walls down, we won't change. Do we want to be like God? Do we want to be a person after his heart? Do we want to do as well? Let's be transparent, ladies. That's what he's asking us to do. Let's pray. Father, we just sit here for a moment thinking about this. It's so hard to be transparent. It's so hard to stand naked. But you see us anyway, which is just the irony of all that. Now, I think, though, that you want us to be honest with ourselves when we're being honest with you, because until we're willing to be honest, you can't change us. You can't make us into the person you know we can be. Give us courage, Lord, as we go through this study to work on being more transparent, to work on being more honest with you, to intentionally let you into our hearts and our minds, to intentionally let you behind the walls, to let you destroy the walls, so that we can be women after your heart, Women who do all your will, all your will, Lord, not just the bits and pieces that are convenient or easy, but all the hard parts. I look forward to how you're going to change us all through this study, Lord. I hope that all the ladies do, too. And I just lift this up in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.